So, my name is Gabe Buckley. I, until recently, was the president of the Liberal Democratic Party, where I served for five years. I'm still on the executive and uh, perennial candidate. Uh, drug law reform has been one of my passions for a long time. And, uh, yeah, ho hopefully some of this gives you some room to think, some wiggle room in your mind, and uh, we'll see how we go. So, beyond marijuana. Uh, cannabis is pretty much a done deal around the world. It, you know, the old prohibitions are collapsing everywhere. Uh, it's certainly going to be well within my lifetime that we can rock up as we're heading home, pull into a shop, buy a couple of nugs, go home and hit the bong, not have to worry about it. So, okay, great, we've done that. What do we do next? Well, let's compare a couple of little plants here. We know our old friend on the left. Anybody seen this one on the right? That's your, would you touch it again? Also called, <laughs> I don't scare easy, I wouldn't touch it again. Um, also known as Jimson Weed or Bishop's Balls, in relation to the seed pods there. Cannabis gets you high, makes you feel relaxed, gives you the giggles, sometimes the munchies. This one's a pretty powerful hallucinogen. In fact, I wouldn't even call it a hallucinogen, it's more of a deliriant. If you've taken shrooms, acid, anything like that, you know that what you're experiencing isn't quite real. Sure, there's a dragon in the kitchen baking brownies, but he's not gonna be there tomorrow and you know that he's gonna go away eventually. This stuff makes it real. You do not know that you are hallucinating. <laughs> it is terrifying. So, almost harmless. This one, the effective dose is about that far away from the fatal dose. You fuck around with this and you're dead. It is toxic. So, what happens if we want to grow these plants in our gardens? One of them gets us a potential jail sentence. The other one we can duck down to the local nursery and pick up a couple of plants, won't set you back more than 20 bucks. Seriously? There are plants we can kill ourselves with all through our gardens. Some that will send us insane, some that'll just make us drop. Our gardens are full of hidden treasures. I would hope that most people can identify the top row. The bottom might be a little more interesting. Uh, across the top, just for anybody, for Fuma, we've got uh, our lovely little shrooms that uh, Colorado has just legalized. Some opium poppies. And a cute little peyote cactus. Now they're the ones we know about. Unfortunately, they're also the ones that the government knows about. So they tell us not to do it. Anybody who lives in my hometown of Brisbane has slipped on these things and fallen flat on their ass. They are the berries of the Araca palm, which, again, you can duck down to the nursery and buy a couple. They're a little bit more expensive than Bishop's Balls, but they're also a bit more attractive. Dry those out. What do you got? Beetle nuts. Used all around the world in various places as a, uh, you know, just a, a stimulant, a drug, something to change the way you feel, the way you think. Pretty harmless stuff. Anybody ever been on holiday in Fiji? Kava. They give it to kids. I had it there when I was about eight years old. Uh, good fun, made my mouth a little bit tingly, but other than that, yeah, not too bad. The golden wattle. This is the wattle, it's the emblem of our land. You can stick it in a bottle, you can hold it in your hand. That is the country's floral emblem, official. Contains a whole shitload of DMT. <laughs> so, we have plants that are illegal. You can go to jail for having those in your garden. Plants that are not illegal. Now, none of those, with the possible exception of the opium poppies, if you start distilling things right down to the heroin and fentanyl end, are particularly dangerous. In fact, humans have used most of these plants for centuries. Uh, for most of their history, they were regarded as no more harmful than rosemary and every bit as effective for our health and well-being as echinacea or green tea. What does that tell us? That the difference between a plant and an illicit drug is cultural. It has nothing at all to do with the inherent properties of that plant or any of the substances that it contains or can be a precursor to. 
the whole thing, the whole reason why cannabis is legal, cannabis is illegal, Datura is legal, has nothing to do with the properties of the plant. We know that one can kill us and one's just going to make us happy. This is a cultural issue and the government has no place in cultural issues. Does the government have the right to tell you how you can feel? No. Good. Do they have the right to tell you what you can think? No. Do they have the right to tell you how you can treat your own body? No. Good. My body, my choice. All drug laws are immoral. When you start overstepping your boundaries, concerning yourself with things that don't concern you, and forcing those impositions on other people, that's pretty much my definition of immorality. All drug laws are regressive. Now, I'm fine. I've got enough money to go and you know just buy my drugs in a fairly inoffensive, unobtrusive manner. I take them home, I smoke them inside. Not much chance of me getting arrested in my comfortable middle-class existence. Poor people have to do theirs on the street. When you have to go down to street level and buy your heroin, that's hard. So the fact that we have these drug laws, they don't really impact me. I, I mean, I can see why the government doesn't want me having a good time, but it doesn't really bother me that much that this stuff's illegal, because I can just go and get it anyway. It's the people who can't just go and do it anyway, who have to go down to street level, who are really impacted by these laws. And if anything this weekend I've noticed the theme is we have to position ourselves so that we're the champions of the underdog. We're doing this shit not because we want to go and get high and have a good time, because we do that already. We want these people to be able to control how they feel, what they think, and how they treat their own bodies in the same way that we can. All drug laws are anti-human. Humans have been using drugs for thousands of years to change how they think, the way they see things. They've powered the creative energies of some of the most incredible individuals over the centuries. To take that away from the human race is disgusting. So what do we do about these drug laws? Ignore the fuckers. <laughs> they don't matter. You know, some people will go to jail, yes. But people are already going to jail. The more we just turn our backs on the government, don't put up a fight, just say, yeah, okay, whatever, that's your opinion, it's not mine. Ignore them. So that's me, that's all I wanted to impart. I'm going to hand over now to somebody who has done a hell of a lot more in this space than I probably ever will. Uh, Ash Blackwell is one of my favourite people on the planet. Uh, I met him a couple of years ago and uh, he runs a, uh, it's a radio program, I guess. It, it's not it, uh, called Encyclope Enci Encyclopedia, if I can speak properly, down in Melbourne, on which he's been kind enough to interview me several times. Uh, he also uh, is working for the Liberal Democratic Party now in David Limerick's office, which is good. We're gradually getting him across the line. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'm going to hand over Ash now and he can tell you all about it. I don't think he's got his own PowerPoint, just but we're just checking. Going to can I be heard? <laughs> As I put the flame to the substance and draw in, my lungs open up and I draw deep. And as I hand the bong over, before my head touches the ground, I'm already leaving this dimension. With a sense of terror, I might add, as my sense of attachment to my body disappears. That's just the beginning. Feel a pressure as I seem to fall through the floor into another dimension. This still is just the beginning. At some point immersed in this abstract space, almost a void of nothingness, I try and reach my arms out and I'm astounded to find that the boundaries of my body no longer exist and I feel like I've stretched to touch the edges of infinity and there's nothing there but energy and power that's so deep and profound, it's like I plugged my fingers into the circuit board of the universe that powers the whole thing and I was shaken and changed forever. That's my story of smoking 5-MeO-DMT, the venom from the Sonoran Desert Toad. I'm not going to tell you when and where, because I might be charged with a crime. We are not a tolerant society. That was one of the most profound spiritual experiences of my life. Probably top, top five of 
the most powerful experiences I've ever encountered. And it's illegal. It's illegal for people to experience these kinds of things. So I kind of wanted to start with a bit of a personal journey and, and you'll find out why I started with that story as I go through. What I want to talk about today is different pathways to reform. So not just beyond cannabis, but beyond the legislative process. What else can be done to challenge these kinds of laws? So I'm going to talk about culture, courts, uh, community and cognitive liberty. So um, I had a bit here to introduce myself, but I think Gabe did that already. I've been doing drug law reform activism things for about eight years, uh, co-founded Students for Sensible Drug Policy Australia, Australia's only youth-based uh, drug policy NGO. And um, I do a lot of work also with the Psychedelic Society in conjunction with hosting a weekly radio show. For this talk, uh, just a couple of acknowledgements. First of all, thanks to Tim Andrews and John Humphreys for inviting me and uh, also making the Drug Law Reform crew who have a table out there today welcome yet again. I'd also like to acknowledge Nick Wallace, uh, the producer of the radio show that I work on. I'm going to be drawing on some of his research from the time when psychedelics were actually prohibited in Victoria. He's done a lot of work digging into Hansard to find out exactly what was said uh, back at the time. And also Prash for organising the psychedelic reading rooms that were happening uh, a few years back where some people would gather and discuss various papers. And he put me on to Charlotte Walsh, a uh, criminolo criminology lecturer from the UK who I'm drawing on a little bit for some of, this, some of this work. So was my experience valid? You know, smoking some 5-MeO DMT, experiencing a profound insight for myself. You know, I had to go away after that and sit down at the back of the dance floor for about three hours and just go, holy shit. What have I just experienced and what does that mean for me about the universe, my relationship to myself, to God, to how I live my life? And it took me years to kind of chew over that. So is it valid? Who gets to decide? Who gets to decide? Do you get to decide that that's not a valid thing for me to do, for other people to do? So what about the history, right? We're going to go on a turbo journey here through some of the history of psychedelic use. So we had the Amanita muscario mushrooms used by shamans in Siberia, uh, I think for thousands of years. India, you had Soma uh, that potentially influenced the writing of the Vedic scriptures. In Greece, you had the Eleusian Mysteries, probably derived from uh, some sort of ergot compound, which is also where LSD is derived from. Then you had South America, you had mushrooms used there, you had them used in Asia. Um, when the Spanish came to South America in 1519, it took them about two years to conquer the country. And when they did, they were like, right, oh, Christianity. We've got to convert these guys to Christianity. And they specifically went after their culture, and their culture involved taking psychedelic mushrooms in a sort of cultural context, uh, you know, with a shaman, spiritual leader, that kind of thing. Their art reflected this, lots of statue, statues of mushrooms these kinds of things, they were seen as an inherent threat to the Christian order. Not much has changed. In the 1930s in Brazil, a church was founded called the Church of Santo Daime. Uh, it's kind of like a church that borrows some traditions from various different religions uh, and also uses DMT, ayahuasca, the traditional brew of shamans in that part of the world. And um, in 1955, Robert Gordon Wasson made his way down to uh, Mexico, and there he met Marina, Maria Sabina, who was um, a traditional sort of uh, shaman, I guess, uh, spiritual leader in that part of the world that used magic mushrooms in um, ceremony there. And he brought them back and um, eventually brought back some spores, and eventually Albert Hoffman synthesized uh, psilocybin, the active compound in magic mushrooms. They took it back to her, and she was like, yep, that's the spirit of the mushroom. You got it. Um, so there are just a few things that, you know, kind of turbo journey through some of the history. I just want to read you a quote from 1967 from the Victorian Legislative Council from when the debate about criminalising psychedelics was happening, because I think it provides a little bit of an insight of uh, where people are coming from. So this is from, um, I think it was James Mutton. Uh, the government should institute a full-scale inquiry into the activities of those unscrupulous people who arouse the curiosity of young people to such an extent that eventually they take drugs to experience their effect. 
I am convinced that many business people in Burke Street and Collins Street are indirectly contributing to the use of these drugs, and I direct the attention of honourable members to an article in the magazine Everybody's, which gives an indication how these articles prey upon the young minds of children and arouse their curiosity to such an extent that they are tempted to experience these drugs. Street society, as hippies call squares, disapprove of the drug taking, but nevertheless, have begun to adopt some of the hippie fads. Psychedelic posters, uh, buttons bearing hip messages and other paraphernalia are now available in Australia. Combined with the revival of Art Nouveau and the influence of psychedelia is being felt in many fields. Dress materials come in vibrant colors and distorted hues, basically scared of wavy lines and bright colors. <laughs> and um, that's the kind of thing, that, that's the level of ignorance, you know, that was, involved in the debate there. Now, it completely ignores the, the history of humanity and psychedelic drug use that goes back thousands of years and was an integral part of many cultures throughout the world. That's not relevant. Oh, fuck, there's going to be scary, wavy lines, and, you know, that's a bit out of the ordinary. So, you know, we've got to shut that down. So I want to move on to some of the ways that we can challenge this. One of the ways that has been attempted, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, around the world is to use the courts. Uh, certain countries around the world have provisions in either their constitution or various human rights charters that should protect the right of someone like myself to smoke the, you know, bufo toad and, um, and have that kind of experience. So the Article 9 of the European Union Human Rights Charter states, and I'll just scroll down, Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in the community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in worship, teaching, practice, and observance. And that's been tried to protect various rights in the UK. Some people, uh, some Rastafarians that uh, smoke cannabis when reading the Bible, that's part of their tradition. Uh, attempted to use that uh, to protect their rights. People that have used ayahuasca in the UK have also used it. I think there was a successful case in India. And um, similar provisions, I mean, you know, look at the United States. The First Amendment there is the one that protects freedom of religion, freedom of expression. And that's the, that's the amendment that protects the right of the Church of Native America uh, to use peyote in their traditional ceremonies. And um, similar... Similar laws have been used in different places around the world, particularly around traditional cultures, to protect their rights. Evo Morales, the president of Bolivia, is like a real strong advocate for this. He's like, fuck you guys, just choose some coca leaves in the UN, you know, going, that's what I think of your laws, mate. They're, they don't actually respect the indigenous people of Bolivia. But what about people that don't have a religion? I don't have a religion. I just think that uh, certain psychedelics enhance my spiritual existence on the planet. Lester Grinspoon and, um, oh, I forget his first name, uh, Bacala, uh, interesting here, Lester Grinspoon was the Harvard psychologist that wrote the first United States government report on cannabis in 1973, after Carl Sagan, the famous scientist, kind of said to him, mate, the government's position here is um, a bunch of bollocks, you need to listen to these guys that are out there smoking weed on the campus. They're, they've got the right of this thing. And what he said about this was, <clears throat> The drug must be not only religiously important to its user, but also an essential part of a traditional right of communal significance. It is as though mountain climbing were regarded as generally so dangerous and useless that climbers would be fined and jailed unless they could prove they were making a pilgrimage to a holy site on, the peak of a uh, on a peak certified by an established church. Um, and that's the, while there's some benefit in making those legal cases, that's also the restriction is it, it, it just confines prohibition, you know, around a different fence. Um, some more interesting cases that have happened in recent history that kind of go a little bit further than that. In um, 2015, I think it was, four people in Mexico uh, took a case to their high court there. Um, and it was on cognitive liberty grounds. In their constitution, there's a um, line that says that people have the right to the free development of one's personality. Uh, similar provisions exist in, um, did I write them? in Belize, Bolivia, Nicaragua, and Peru. 
Um, South Africa has similar provisions in its constitution. You often find that with countries that have been through some kind of violent experience, right? When they, when they rewrite their constitution, there's, you know, people are like, holy shit, you know, things can go really bad. How do we put into our constitution a protection so that people can take the government to court when the government starts overstepping uh, its authority? So um, I had the pleasure of me meeting James Stobbs and Myrtle Clark when I was at the Beyond Psychedelics conference in Prague last year. And they're known in South Africa as the Dacher couple. Uh, that's the colloquial term for cannabis in South Africa. And for the last eight years or so, they've been slowly grinding a case through the court there that is essentially argued on cognitive liberty grounds that everybody should have the right to use, grow, consume cannabis. If that, if that is successful, that'll set a precedent that essentially legalizes cannabis in South Africa overnight. It's likely to be successful. The government doesn't have like a strong case against it. They've tried everything. It's been going on for eight years. Their evidence brief is from here to the podium over there. Um, they, when they made that case, it was interesting. There was, some le there was a law firm that was like, yes, we've been waiting for this. We're going to represent you for free. Um, and so that's kind of working its way through there. I think it's interesting to keep track of these kinds of things. Outside of that, though, the other important element, and I don't have much time, so I'll just briefly touch on a couple of things here, is culture, the wavy lines. I went past the Vivid Festival last night on my way home, and um, it was funny. There was all this like weird psychedelic-looking art everywhere and uh, a whole bunch of kids having a really good time. Turns out the friend that I was staying with is um, friends with um, one of the artists that helped design it. You know, he's a burner, probably a psychonaut. I, mean, you know, I don't know. I don't want to dob him in for anything. but. Um, People love the kind of art inspired by that community. So what's happening out in the community? Prash is going to talk a little bit about what's happening with the medical uh, advancements in psychedelics. I think that something that's happening that tracks parallel to that is the popularity of psychedelic drugs in the community is increasing and is not going to stop. That's, you know, that's all fine and well and good, but um, there are risks and hazards that come with that. I certainly wouldn't recommend that any of you go home and smoke Bufo Alvarez tonight. It's terrifying. Um, you kind of want to know what you're doing, right? Before you jump out of an aeroplane, you get somebody to pack your parachute. You, you, you know, you take a few lessons. Dive with someone else first. Um, also with this is the cryptocurrencies and darknet markets, they're not going to disappear, neither is information. So these things are going to keep existing in society. So how do we look after society to make sure that there's some kind of responsible space around which use happens? Because I think even if we did take it to the government and the government went, yeah, right oh, let's legalise psychedelics, that could be quite bad, right? The first time somebody goes out and has a really shit time and it happens in public, they get their kid off and go run in front of traffic because they're, you know, a bit wigging out, then the regulatory crackdown would happen instantly. So how do we... How do we responsibly legalize psychedelics? Well, I think one of the ways is to enhance community. Um, my old housemate's in the room. He's, uh, until recently, he was running the uh, integration circles for the Australian Psychedelic Society down in Melbourne. And that was a place where if somebody had an experience like the one I spoke of at the start of the talk, and they were like, man, I don't know what to make of that. Um, you know, it's kind of thrown my whole life in a bit of a twist. You can go and speak to people that <coughs> understand that experience, that can you know, help you integrate it and understand it. And if there's more significant problems going on there, go, well, actually, I think that it's a bit beyond this little circle. Maybe you should actually go see a professional. I think the other thing, well, actually, just on that. So I think the, the Spanish model for cannabis regulation is really interesting. They have cannabis clubs. You've got to be a member of a club. And if you're a member of that club, you can kind of like grow and trade cannabis within that little club. I think that might be an interesting model for psychedelics. Otherwise, you have um, some kind of professionalized, medicalized monopoly. And um, medical people aren't always the best to deal with these kinds of things. You know, if you start telling a story about how a, um, you know, eight-armed octopus broke apart your soul and you could see the various different bits in a way they might go, okay, I think you're nuts, actually. Um, whereas somebody who's got some, they're like, okay, yeah, I've had some weird experiences too. What did you learn? Um, so I think that's a little bit interesting. I think as well, one thing that um, is worth paying attention to is, um, so what we're talking about here is freedom of thought. And freedom of thought 
in my opinion, has primacy in all kinds of other freedoms. Freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and freedom of religion derived from freedom of thought. So from my point of view, it is the most important freedom. And any time when people are forbidden from speaking or expressing ideas like the ones I'm talking about today, you should pay close attention to that. Because uh, the, the challenge of diversity of thought, when that gets stepped on, it might start with people like me, but that's uh, a warning sign of a trajectory that might come. Anyway, uh, eat mushrooms, see the universe. <laughs> Yep. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Ash. You can always pick the uh, the drug law reform guys at any libertarian conference. Big hats, sunglasses. <laughs> it has something to do with our very sensitive eyes. I felt like there was a <laughs> our next speaker is Arvinds O'Brien. Arvinds is a second generation libertarian warrior, uh, defending freedom all her life. Yeah. Uh, unlike. Some of us, she doesn't have the shame of having to come from the left to uh, be in the right place. Arvins is one half, and as I pointed out to the other half, the better half, of a... Uh, I said I was the prettier and smarter half. I, I may have gone to uh, a fair bit of uh, length in describing how much better Arvins was than Judd, but we were going to have Judd on this panel. Uh, things came up, life happened, and uh, we now have Arvins instead, which is great. So. I will let Arvinds go and uh, tell you all about it. You can use this one, that one. I, oh, before you do, I do need to make mention that we are using the Hoover app. As everybody else has said, I don't want to miss out on my chance to say Hoover. So put your questions in there. We'll read them out at the end. Uh, unless you really want to get up and make a statement, I don't give a shit. <laughs> excellent, excellent. It's funny, I, I was going to say, if you have a physical program, you might have been expecting to see my hairier half here, uh, Chad Weiss, but, uh, but he was unable to make it. Uh, actually, drug-related, but not the bad kind. Um, <laughs> well, I'll explain that. Um, so I love that this panel is called Beyond Marijuana, and I love that everyone here is discussing something beyond marijuana. But I actually want to talk a little bit about, about marijuana just to, to bring it bring it back to how uh, to how we're gonna be moving forward in things like legalization um, in case you're curious when it comes to beyond marijuana the uh, how beyond marijuana I go the answer is all the way um, uh, you know as a libertarian um, I believe you own your own body and you have the right to put whatever the fuck you want into it nobody ha uh, no, ma no matter how potentially harmful someone else might think it is I appreciate that everyone here is talking about that like the nuances of these experiences and how we should uh, uh, we should teach other people about you using them responsibly and, and that's wonderful I was raised this way as we said second generation uh, my parents were libertarian activists in the 70s and 80s in the US I'm actually <laughs> I'm actually, uh, I kind of exist because of marijuana, um, because in, uh, in, 1970, in the 1970s, my dad was a libertarian activist in Massachusetts who, uh, who had a radio talk show about libertarianism. And he was doing a lot of activism in, in Boston, and he decided to uh, <laughs> commit an illegal act. Um, he, he did this whole thing on uh, uh, on his college. Whoop, hello, okay, he did this whole thing on his college campus where he basically said, "Hey, you know, on Thursday at." Uh, at 4 p.m., I'm going to commit an illegal act on the quad of my college campus. And then everyone showed up to see what it was, and he carried a marijuana plant across the campus to basically say, this is so stupid that this is, uh, that this is illegal. Uh, this got him kicked out of college. And, uh, and then he ended up moving up to New Hampshire, where he decided to volunteer on a libertarian congressional campaign. And that libertarian congressional campaign was my grandfather, and my mother had convinced him to run for Congress as a libertarian. So my parents met on that campaign, fell in love, had some kids, and here I am. Uh, so yay, marijuana! <laughs> um, and it's funny because growing up in that community, in a libertarian community, my family had some very colorful acquaintances, including people like Murray Rothbard, including people like Robert Anton Wilson, and including people like Timothy Leary. Um, so I, I, drugs are fun because I, it's really amusing. When I was a teenager, I was hanging out with some people, and I suddenly smelled marijuana, and I was like, hey, that's how dad smells sometimes. <laughs> and so you know, it, like drugs had always been an open conversation in my life, and. Uh, and, and my parents had never said, don't do them. They just said, be careful. 
And, uh, and so I'm, I appreciate that I had that kind of upbringing. Uh, but I'm actually here because I sell drugs. Um, <laughs> So, yes, I live in Los Angeles, and I sell recreational cannabis, not medicinal cannabis, recreational cannabis. Um, I help run this company. It is called Lit Club with my partner, Judd Weiss, who was supposed to be on this panel, but you got me instead. Um, and actually, the reason that he's not here is because we are in the middle of an investor raise, and investors do not like it when the CEO disappears for eight days to come to Australia and talk about drugs. Um, so, so here I am. Uh, and we started this company at the very end of 2017. Recreational cannabis was legalized in California during the November 2016 election. Uh, prior to that, we'd had 20 years of medicinal marijuana in California. Um, and the reason I'm focusing on marijuana, I know the talk is about beyond marijuana, but the reason I'm focusing is because I think that one, uh, the US creates a really interesting uh, way to see how, how legalization can happen of any substance, um, and, uh, and because it's, it's going to inform how we legalize other things. Um, so I've actually been doing marijuana uh, advocacy for a very long time. As a teenager, uh, well, in 2004, as, as a teenager, I began working with advocacy groups in New Hampshire attempting to legalize or at least medicinalize uh, marijuana. This did not go particularly well. Um, and even, even though New Hampshire has a very libertarian reputation uh, in, as a state in, in the US, uh, they've still failed to legalize recreational marijuana. Like, this is, it's been 15 years since then, and it's completely and saying that this is still illegal. Um, but I have helped campaign for legalization in several US states, uh, in New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Nevada, and California, and a couple others. Um, but this is, it's such an interesting training ground to figure out the best ways to legalize. Um, in the US, marijuana was, uh, was made illegal for use or possession uh, federally in 1970, but California was the first to legalize medicinal marijuana in 1996. Now, in 2019, we have 50, so we have 50 states in the US and we have varying degrees of marijuana acceptance. There's commercial recreational legalization of uh, THC where you can actually go out, go to a store, buy it if you're over 21. Uh, there is legalized medicinal. Um, there is legalized medicinal but only CBD. So there's a couple of states that only have that. There is decriminalized where you end up not having a legal penalty for the possession of, but you can't sell it, you can't, you can't go out and buy it. Um, and then there are still states in the US that are fuck you go to jail states. Um, Alabama, which is a, an authoritarian clusterfuck for a number of reasons, uh, is a state where possession of a single joint is punishable by up to one year in prison. In that state, there are lots of people that get caught with possession of a single joint and they don't go to prison, but those people tend to be white. And this is actually just a very blatant racist, uh, racist thing where the courts, they just, they, they, there are some people that don't make it through. Um, 33 of 50 states in the US have legalized medicinal use of cannabis. Uh, 14 more restrict THC, but allow medicinal CBD. So that's 47 states that have some form of, uh, of legalized cannabis. Uh, 15 uh, states have decriminalized marijuana, and then 10 states have full le legal recreational markets. Those states are Alaska, California, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Nevada, Oregon, Vermont and Washington. Uh, we've encountered good things and bad things as we've legalized. Um, some states have legalized through legislative fights. They've gone through state representatives and state senates. They've passed bills to legalize that were then, uh, that were then signed by um, governors. Uh, and then some states have legalized through ballots, leaving the votes up to the people. California was one of those. And this was really interesting in California because um, as a libertarian, I basically don't like to vote for anything that would raise a tax. And in California, we were presented with this option that you could, that we could make marijuana completely legal, but it would be regulated and taxed. And some California libertarians were like, oh, hell no, I'm not doing that. But one of the provisions within that ballot measure was, uh, was a provision that said that any single person with a criminal record or currently in jail for a conviction that would no longer be illegal under the new law, would be let out of jail and would have their criminal record expunged. And that, to me, was a huge thing because that changes lives and that gets people out of cages. And so even though I sat there and went, oh, fuck, taxes, I said, 
let's get people out of cages. That's important. And so it passed. So yay, we, had rec we have recreational legal marijuana in uh, California. But like this hasn't been a perfect thing. There are others, there are different states. There's Colorado, Washington, and California are kind of the three states that have, uh, that, that are most known for their legalization efforts. Uh, Colorado's done it very, like very well, and there's been, it's been a booming market. It's been, uh, it's been people, there's a lot of tourism to Denver just so they can go smoke some marijuana. Um, uh, Washington has had some struggles between the medicinal and the legal side of things, and California's had some struggles. And I, I can speak most to California because I live there, I work there, I sell drugs there. Um, so getting licensed to produce or to sell marijuana is still a pain in the ass and it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. You have to get special licenses from the government in order to grow it, special licenses in order to manufacture it, special licenses in order to distribute it, and so special li licenses to own a dispensary. Um, but if you're just a regular user and you go, hey, I just want to go and get some cannabis, you can just walk into his place, show your ID to show that you're 21, and you can go buy whatever marijuana you want. Buy Lit Club, it's great. Um, so, but the taxes are ridiculous. And other states, Colorado and Washington, I mean, one of the incentives when we were talking, when, when activists were attempting to bring marijuana uh, legalization to state governments was saying, hey, you get to tax it, you get to regulate it, it's gonna, hey, you're gonna get some money, it's gonna be great. Um, and Washington and Colorado took a like, slightly more conservative approaches about how much money they wanted to get out of this. But California has high taxes in general, we're known for that. Uh, depending on what mun municipality or county you are in, the taxes increase. So aggregate taxes on legal recreational taxes, it, on marijuana, in California can be as high as 45%. So I go to buy $100 worth of marijuana, I'm spending 150. Um, this means we have a thriving black market, still. Like, we, we, like this is the funniest thing, is when we're talking, like, I, like as a libertarian, I'm always saying, once you legalize it, the, the black market will go away. Not if you tax it to high heaven, because then people are just gonna go get it from their dealer. Because the, it, this is the hilarious thing, by the way, is that in California, because it's not legal, uh, because you have to go through all these hoops to now get your farm or your manufacturer, your farming license or your manufacturing license, what happens is there's still people growing marijuana outside the system, and when they can't get the correct license to sell it, they sell it to the black market. And then the black market goes, cool, I can sell that a lot cheaper than, uh, than MedMen over there or any of the other, uh, uh, any of the other um, companies uh, or the, the other dispensaries. Um, so in California, so 2016 we voted to legalize. 2017 the government decided to take a year to figure out how those laws were going to look, and 2018 uh, finally we had legal recreational. Uh, and so in t <laughs> this was insane. Um, in, in 2018, California spent $500 million less on legal cannabis than they did in 2017. In 2017, you had to go to a doctor. And you had to say, I really need some like medicinal cannabis because I'm really stressed or I have bad cramps or whatever. You, it was pretty easy. There were some there were some hoops to jump through, but at the end of the day, you could pay forty dollars and say I need a, a medicinal license, and you could get it, and you could go and you could buy tax free marijuana in 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 a dispensary. Um, but you had to jump through that hoop. And as soon as it was legal, and all you had to do was walk in with your driver's license and get your marijuana suddenly people spent $500 million less on it because the taxes were so high, and uh, so what's really funny is now California is trying to calibrate, and that means California Democrats are saying, maybe taxes are too high, which is really cool. I love it when California, like when, when Democrats suddenly think, oh shit, taxes are too high. Um, but we're also dealing with, uh, with, with other things that are coming up through, uh, through that legalization. Uh, not just smoking marijuana, but we also have things like edibles. People can, can have edible marijuana. You can go and get cookies that, that are... Uh, uh, that have uh, certain amounts of THC in them. And what we're struggling with right now is dosaging. And this is another thing where it's like, when advocates for drugs are talking about, um, are talking about legalizing drugs, we wanna start talking about using them responsibly. And so, uh, as I said, Judd and I have this brand called Lit Club, and right now we sell smokables, and we, smell va we uh, sell vapables, and we're soon going to be selling uh, uh, like cookies, right? We're gonna do some kind of ingestible. And when we do, 
we want to respect the fact that most people haven't tried ingestible marijuana and uh, and they're going to try it for the first time and if they take too much they're gonna get fucked up and they're never gonna want to do it again because that's actually what happens a lot of the time um, and so we've actually been trying to create a gentleman's agreement within the industry outside of the law just saying hey let's agree that we should make a standard dosage that's a lot smaller than what other people are trying to do um, so it's been really interesting because we have this green wave happening in the US and now people within the industry are trying to find their way, uh, the ways to internally regulate and uh, without having the government come in and tell us what we have to do. Um, and we're watching, and we're watching this, this fight about taxation, we're watching this fight about, about how to make these, the, these uh, uh, how, to make <laughs> how to make drugs more accessible, it's great. Um, but what's really fun is while this is happening, while this green wave is happening and you know the majority of states have some kind of legal cannabis, we're also watching suddenly other things popping up. So Denver this month voted to decriminalize shrooms, which was just like, that came out of nowhere. Like I haven't been working on shrooms, I've been working on cannabis, and suddenly I'm like, wait, I can go to Denver and get shrooms? Like that, that came out of nowhere and it was so awesome because that's what we're seeing is with this kind of increased acceptance of marijuana, we're also seeing an increased acceptance of psychedelics. We're seeing this increased acceptance of all of these, these drugs. And I think, you know, honestly, I think Burning Man has a part to do with it because now everyone thinks Burning Man's cool and everyone knows that I go to the desert and do acid and MDMA for like a week and they're like, oh yeah, let's do that. Um, and so I think it's, it's actually really interesting to see the kind of cultural wave that's happening because it's, Marijuana is a gateway drug. It's just a gateway drug to acceptance of other drugs, and I'm very happy about that. Um, but we've also been seeing things like uh, like uh, ketamine has been a thing that's suddenly popped up in the U.S. Ketamine has been legal. It's a horse tranquilizer that is also used for uh, various painkillers, and it's also used as a um, uh, it's also used as a treatment for depression. And it used to be extremely difficult to get, and now there are clinics all over the U.S. where you have to talk to a doctor, they have to confirm that you are clinically depressed, but you can go get IV ketamine. And it's not that difficult to do. I mean, it, like, if it can cost anywhere from $500 to $5,000 to do it, but it's actually kind of, it's amazing that this thing is suddenly there. Like, I'm, I'm watching, in the last five years, the, the recreational drug, the medicinal drugs, have suddenly just blown up in the U.S. and I'm I'm really excited about it and I think that that's as we see these uh, as we see these markets uh, in cannabis grow and we see what's what's failed and what's succeeded I think that this is a really good way of seeing how the rest of these other drugs are going to succeed and fail anyway I think I'm out of time so you guys go for it. Evans O'Brien. Thanks Evans. And that, that point about acceptability is, is so valid. A couple of weeks ago, I stood up on a stage outside Parliament House in Brisbane and smoked a joint and the world went, yeah, so what? <laughs> Love it. Prash is the CEO of Caleb and Brown, who was Australia's first cryptocurrency brokerage. Um, so to tell you all about Bitcoin and blockchain and all the other really cool stuff. No, Prash is also a doctor. Um, trained in psychiatry and doing some really, really interesting things in this space. So I'll hand you over and please make him welcome. Right. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Prush and I'm a psychedelic psychiatrist. That's the operative term I'd like to go by. Um, I'm sorry if that introduction was a bit distracting. I do wear a couple of hats. Interestingly, I haven't heard much conversation about cryptocurrency this weekend. Um, it's been a, a little bit odd for me, considering it fits very squarely, you know, regardless of which way you look at it, into um, libertarian discussions. But we're here to talk about psychedelics, or at least I'm here to talk about psychedelics. And the reason why I'm here to talk about psychedelics is that my main research interest <laughs> is in psychedelics, but particularly it's in the therapeutic use of psychedelics in psychotherapy. First, a couple of things that I would like to, perhaps definitions to be discussed. Um, the difference between recreational use and therapeutic use, and uh, with regards to discussion today, all well, the points I'm making are with regards to therapeutic use. Um, but regardless of whether we're talking about recreational use or therapeutic use, a few things to understand about psychedelics is one, and this is where I'm trying to debunk some misconceptions that have continued for years, 
Um, psychedelics have zero addiction potential. Zero. Zero physiological addiction potential. If you can bring me someone who's physiologically addicted to a psychedelic, I will stop giving these talks. Psychedelics have zero overdose potential. Again, physiologically zero overdose potential and the same previous rule applies. Psychedelics also have no statistically significant increase in psychotic switch. So the idea of Charlie who took a tab of acid and went crazy, or maybe Charlie was going to go crazy anyway. And I shouldn't use the word crazy in vain, but some people have a genetic predisposition to developing a psychotic illness and in those people, psychedelics, much like cannabis, have the potential to set that off. But they don't cause schizophrenia. The rates of psychotic illnesses, um, the prevalence of psychotic illness is exactly the same in the uh, psychedelic using population as in the general population. There was a 150,000 person respondent survey, I think it's Krebs, Krebs et al. from 2013, which demonstrated that. So just some of those misconceptions to get out the way so we don't barge into this with this preloaded, um, or the preloaded stigma that has plagued this conversation for so long. Now when we're talking about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, again, let me clarify this. It's psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. It's not the psychedelic, it's not the substance, it's not the biochemical effect of the substance that's causing any of the effect that has been postulated that it does. Rather, it's the use of psychedelic as an adjunct, as a catalyst in the psychotherapeutic encounter to produce the effect. It's really about the psychotherapy, but the fact that the psychedelic sort of opens up new windows, opens up new perspectives um, and paradigm shifts, which the psychotherapist can then work through in the integration is where all the magic happens. Um, is this something you guys have heard about? Psychedelic assisted psychotherapy? I mean, it's been on Facebook, so it's there. It must be real. Um, <laughs> it, it really kick-started off again in the early 2000s after being buried for, for decades. Um, it didn't used to be that way. Between 1950 and 1970, the US government funded about 120 different trials into psychedelics. This is also the time when um, Sandoz Laboratories in Basel, Switzerland, um, who had synthesized um, acid for the first time, it's where Albert Hoffman worked, um, had packaged it into something called dialysid and were basically sending it out to any scientist in the world who requested it. What a great time to have been alive. <laughs> Uh, because they were desperate to find some sort of um, marketable use for it. It's pointless having something that has all this effect if you can't sell it, right? If you can't make money from it. So they're sending it everywhere. And the US government were one of the first um, you know, regions of major uptake for this. But then in 1970, Richard Nixon signed the Controlled Substances Act. Everything went underground and research completely stalled, which is really unfortunate. Because there was a lot of good research happening at the time. Unfortunately, like a lot of the good research, a lot of the research happening at the time, sample studies were small. Um, sort of uh, the validity of a lot of the drug protocols were poor. Um, quality was not always maintained. I mean, these were ear early days of research. And so looking back to the studies in back then, back in the day, um, has not been able to hold up to scrutiny currently. <laughs> so thankfully, um, research, research has started up again. And I won't go through it in too much detail, but a couple of interesting ones to point out. Um, over at Johns Hopkins um, and the University of New York um, are the studies into psilocybin for end-of-life terminal anxiety. Um, in Imperial College in London, um, psilocybin for a terminal depression, oh sorry, psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. Um, there are various studies around University of New Mexico in Canada um, looking into LSD for alcohol use disorders, which is a real mindfuck for people who consider psychedelics a drug if you want to buy into the value loaded term that drug is. Because the idea that you can use a drug to treat a drug addiction really spins people out and all I ask you to take away from that is to remove the word drug from the conversation and consider one as a substance and another as another one and that addiction can be an addiction to anything whether it's coffee, heroin or pornography um, and the fact that these, sub these substances and the therapeutic encounter has the power to unlock that um, or reverse that process is what really needs to be considered but anyway I digress there. Um, some of the studies that are happening around the world uh, something to be congratulated is that as of this year, in early 2019, um, Australia has finally gotten approval for its first ever psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy trial. 
Um, this is at the St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, and it's for psilocybin um, for the terminally ill, for the people for, well, for, yeah, to, to treat anxiety in people who are dying. The reason why that got off the ground, I mean, it's been a two-year process in the making to get to this point. Uh, and the reason why that got off the ground, fortunately or unfortunately, I mean, you can't, you can't deny the fact that there's a huge element of like, well, well they're dying anyway, so, hmm. uh, But I'm not complaining if it gets it off the ground. But I'm going to use that trial as an example, perhaps just to delve for a couple of minutes into how these substances perhaps have their effect. Um, and just, just using that example. Let's take the dying, let's take people who are being faced with their own mortality or the impending mortality. That is an anxiety provoking experience for a number of reasons. And the, pri the primary one is that, look, we all, we all have an ego and ego is a necessary psychological construct that helps scaffold your very mushy insides. And at one end you have anxiety, at the other end you have narcissism. Um, and the sense of self sits squarely across this spectrum. Impending death, is a great, leads to a great fear, but an impending loss of that sense of self. It's a, it's an, it's a narcissistic injury, and it's a, it leads to this idea of, this, it's an ego destruction from a psychological sense, um, and pushes you way back down the spectrum if you want to really use this sort of diagrammatical representation towards the anxiety side of things. And that's where a lot of the anxiety comes from. Now, key to the psychedelic experience is the idea of ego disillusion. Very different from destruction, the idea of <coughs> disillusion where your ego gently dissolves till you are reduced down to pure matter or pure consciousness, depending on which spiritual way you want to look at it. To be able to go through the experience of having your ego dis dissolve, to be able to understand how purely illusory, illusory, the idea of an ego has always been to your existence, to consider how unnecessary it may be, and to be able to understand that you can face the future without holding on to your ego with such a strong bind, makes a huge difference to be then be able to march on towards a potential demise of that sense of self without the anxiety that you otherwise would hold. I hope that made sense to people in some, in some way, um, but that's one of the basic premises behind psychedelic therapy. Um, unfortunately, getting this off the ground has been torturous. It's been a two-year process. State approval's done, federal approval's done. There's still TJ approval, which is the equivalent of the FDA approval. Then there's medical board approval. Then there's PBS, which is pharmaceutical benefits team approval. Then there's customs and excise approval. And then there's, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know how many more approvals there are. It's a long, long process. And it's very hard when the entire movement is being driven from the bottom up with no top-down support, and most of the time with top-down resistance. And that's twofold. There's top-down resistance from a policy side of things, but also immense top-down resistance from a medical side of things. And that's incredibly frustrating for me as a doctor. Why won't people get on board? And there are multiple reasons for it. I mean, one is illegality. And doctors are largely very conservative beings. Um, unless you've been to a medical student party, and that's a slightly <laughs> different situation. <laughs> but then it's all forgotten at the door, right, from that point on. Um, so the illegality is a problem. There's enormous stigma that the entire space has been laden with, and all, a lot of this was attributable to the fact that psychedelics were always intrinsically linked with the counterculture revolution of the 60s, right? It's been an uh, unfortunate stain, at least in attempts to legitimize it from a medical standpoint. Um, and this limited scalability. Now, there's a very niche group of people actually working in this. Um, in Australia, I can probably count off my two hands the number of us who are actually interested in this. And trying to get something like the psychiatric community, for example, to, to get interested um, when it ha you have in all your odds stacked up against you. Now, psychiatry and psychiatric medications really have not seen any truly justifiable improvements in decades. The three classes of antidepressants, the ones that make you fat, the ones that make you uh, sleep, and the ones that make you put on weight. And we really haven't shifted that very much. The idea of something that goes beyond that is counterintuitive and almost a paradigm leap that the medical community has been struggling to make. Um, and there continues to be the fight that, 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 that's fought, um, at least by people like me. The reason why I think it's vitally important that we get medical therapeutics in psychedelics across the board is because I think it's a stepping stone towards greater 
um, mainstream acceptance. Now, there have been multiple different um, attitudes suggested in terms of where legalization should and would stem from. Um, Ash Skye discussed the sort of the cultural side of things crucially. Uh, for me, the medical side is important because it's a Trojan horse. Um, the medical community has all been, always been looked on with some form of reverence, whether we des deserve it or not. Um, and getting that medical stamp on things goes a long way to, to getting the conversation out in the air. The idea of medicalization, then decriminalization, then legalization, and then later social acceptance and recre recreational acceptance um, is a path that's been discussed plenty of times before. And out there, in the, in, uh, well, out there, at least in the, in the psychedelic community, there's this constant to and fro as to what's, what's the greater approach um, in terms of moving this forward. My fear is that psychedelics will always be the most dangerous drug in the world. Well, they are the most dangerous drug in the world. They, they may be the safest, but danger has got nothing to do with harm. Danger is defined purely by the box and the people who drew that box. And if you're trying to fight against the box, psychedelics will always be the most dangerous, drug, dangerous drugs because they open your eyes, right? Um, the Doors of Perception, which is a book some of you have, may have read, came from a poem by William Blake in 1798 called The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Uh, he writes, for when the doors of perception are cleansed, man will see the world for what it truly is, infinite, for he sees the world through the narrow chinks of his cabin. I think this entire movement is about trying to open up those doors of perception um, to not see the world through the chinks of our cabin. And for me, psychedelics are a crucially important part of that journey and that discussion. Uh, thank you. <laughs>